Well, as we get into this little section we're going to look at this morning, I'd like to start by saying, uh, I think one thing that becomes real apparent early in life is how easily people can be fooled. Huh? I mean, you know, uh, we can be fooled ourselves. Uh, if you're not on the guard April Fool's Day, watch out, you know. I mean, my wife, she's, uh, she, she's not a kidder. I'm the kidder in the family. So when April Fool's Day comes, she catches me every time. You know, lay something on me. Oh, really? And then she looks at me and goes, April Fool. <laughs> Heard the story of a, of a farmer. This was back in the day. And, uh, <clears throat> and he, was, uh, he had his horses. They just drooled. Terrible. They, they were just droolers. They just drooled on everything, you know. Well, he's reading a farming publication, and he sees an ad in there that says, uh, you know, a cure for the, the your drooling horses, you know. The, you know, there's a cure, and for $20, you send for it, and we'll send you the cure. And so that caught his eye. And back then, $20, you know, that was a meaningful little sum of money. But he sort of scraped it up because he really wanted it, you know. And he sent it off, you know, for the cure. Well, you know, a few weeks later, you know, an answer comes, and it's just a little envelope, and he opens it up, and there's one little sheet of paper in it, and it says, teach your horses to spit. <laughs> you know, talking about that whole, you might say, quality in us uh, to be conned, um, Donald Bar Barnhouse tells about something he, when he was a teenager, he and his friends did. And in a, in a large city, they went to a very crowded street corner. And they, they sort of gathered around a few of them. And they started looking up in the sky. Just looking up in the sky and pointing. Looking up in the sky and pointing. And then one said loud enough for people walking around to hear, it, it is. It, it, there it is. It, 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 it is. And the other guy says, oh, it is not. And then the guy says, oh, yes, it is. He says, no, it's not. Well, you can imagine what people are doing. They're walking along and, and they're kind of looking up there, you know, to see what's going on. And these guys are getting more heated in their argument. It is so, it is not, you know. And so more people are coming to look. And then gradually as this is going on, kind of one by one, he and his buddies sort of walk out of the crowd, you know. Just, just, and they get a few yards away and everything. And they look back and here's a group of about 15 people looking up in the sky, you know, like this. And then more people would come to see what they're looking. And then other people had been there for a while just like that and walk away. 20 minutes later, there was still a group of people looking up there. Some people had walked over, you know, walked over and just leaned against the building and were just staring up there, you know, to see what was up there. They were just up there looking at nothing. And, and uh, you know, he, this is, this is the, the point he made from their little, their, their little uh, practical joke. That little incident is a good illustration of all the earth-born religions. People talk about having faith. They tell you to look in a direction where there is absolutely nothing. Some people are so desperately in need of seeing something that they'll look until they're almost blind. Yet they never catch a glimpse of anything real. We come to chapter 2 verse 8, brethren, and Paul now launches into the Terrible danger of being spiritually deceived. Spiritually deceived. And, and sadly, I've seen it as a pastor. I remember early on in my ministry, a young guy came to our church named Rodney. And, and just off the street kind of a guy. And, and I started discipling this young man in the word and like that. And then one Sunday evening, he didn't show up at church. And I thought, oh, oh, you know, where's Rodney? Well, one o'clock in the morning, I got a hammer at my door. And I went, what? And he's, he's, he's yelling, Brian, Pat, Brian, are you there? And I could tell Rodney's voice. And I went out there and said, Rodney, what is going on here? And Rodney decided to just take a walk downtown. I think it was Long Beach. And came across a group that pulled him in. And he was telling me, oh, it was so neat. Oh, it was so great. And I said, well, what is this? Well, it turned out to be just an out and out cult if there ever was one. Some of you'll remember the, uh, I think it was Unification Church, Reverend Sun Myung Moon. You know what he would say? He would say, Jesus failed. He ended up on the cross. Well, I'm here to be Christ. I'm Christ. Follow me. 
And Rodney got sucked into it. I didn't see him for quite a while. And finally, when I saw him, I said, Rodney, come here. And I opened up the word and I showed him clearly in the word what the word says versus what he was saying. It didn't help. He was totally sucked in. Broke my heart. I've seen a, a, you know, a family, beautiful Christian family. Mom and dad love the Lord, you know? And, and then their son growing up and he became, I don't know, late teens or something like that. And he ended up running off and following an, a guru, you know, think, oh, oh, the answer's there. Reminds me of what he said back in verse 4 of chapter 2 when he says, uh, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. You know, what's really sad is when pastors get off base. And pastors start going off in some weird direction or weird tangent. I remember the story of Billy Graham and a very, very dear friend of his that he co-labored with in the ministry early on before he became, you know, the, the great evangelist that he was. And this guy got caught up in, in that what they call textual criticism of the Bible and, and, and became convinced that you really couldn't rely on the Bible anymore. You really couldn't call it God's word anymore. That's why as I preach here, I want to make it very clear to you, I am not the authority. This is the authority right here. Don't ever take my word for anything. You make sure it jives and, and agrees with, with the word of God because this is the authority, not me or not, not anyone else. And you know, I've seen over the years, and it's so true, it's possible for seemingly healthy believers to get led astray. That's possible. In fact, grab this. Scripture says that it, is, it will be a sign of the times in the last days. This very thing. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Do not be deceived, for the day of the Lord will not come lest the apostasy, the falling away, comes first. Wow. Jesus said this regarding those last days. He was talking about the last days in Matthew 24, 24 when he said, For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So brethren, we're going to look at, at a warning in Scripture here that cries out down through the ages. And it's more relevant today and now Probably than ever. And already I get two basic points here as we look at these next few verses of God's word. And that is, listen, listen. This is important because it's happening when we don't even realize it. Beware of human wisdom. Beware of human wisdom. Notice what he says in verse 8. That's where he pick it up. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit. According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. You know, when he says right there, beware lest anyone cheat you. That word cheat in the Greek means to plunder you. It, it, it means to, to be taken captive. It'd it be, be ripped off and taken prisoner by an enemy, you know? It, it, it literally, to be kidnapped. And he says, beware, lest you get kidnapped in this area. Well, how does that happen? He tells us right here, through philosophy and empty deceit. Brethren, beware of the world's philosophies, you know, the, the ideas, uh, the, 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 the thinking about what, what life's about, uh, what, what matters and what doesn't matter, uh, where happiness and fulfillment come from, you know, all the various philosophies of the world. We are, every one of us, constantly barraged by the world's viewpoint through the movies we see, through television, through the internet, through uh, the popular thinking of the day, attitudes of the day. 
Brethren, it can so subtly taint your faith in Jesus Christ. It can affect it. It can twist it a little bit. You know? And I see Christians subtly buying in to these worldly philosophies. Oh, hey. We all know now that Jesus isn't the only way. How narrow and bigoted it is to think anything like that. Um, <clears throat> the standard of morality is different now, you know. It's, it's just different. Uh, times have changed. And, and we've got to sort of, you know, understand that those standards are different now. You know, it's not like it used to be. Things like, you know, the Bible, it has errors in it. I think that's pretty become I don't know, a lot of mythology in there. Maybe there's some good things to say in it, you know. It's got some good things to say, but you can't rely on it. Brethren, brethren, brethren. Beware lest anyone rip you off through philosophy and empty deceit. These are the exactly things he's talking about. See, worldly philosophies of life are ultimately deceiving. That it, it, and, and, and they come up empty. That, that there's nothing there, really. You know, the most renowned um, philosophers of the world have a skewed view of what this is all about. Many of you heard the name Nitschke. I mean, he, he's one of the most renowned philosophers of the world. You know where it got him? His philosophy got him? He made this statement. He said, alas, grant me madness. And the interesting thing about that is exactly what happened. The last 11 years of his life, he was totally insane. That's where it got him. Jean Paul Sartre. It's a French philosopher, very, very popular. Uh, he won the 1964 Nobel Prize for Literature. His writings are, are popular to this day. Here's what, what he comes to in his philosophical view of ungodly, Christ-denying, God-denying view of life, which Nitsky was the same way. He was a total atheist. Sartre, Sartre said this, Life is empty. Life, excuse me. Life is an empty bubble on the sea of nothingness. That's where it brings you. He said this, And I myself, I too am superfluous. I dreamed vaguely of killing myself to wipe out at least one of these superfluous existences. But even my death would have been superfluous. Wow. You've all heard the name Voltaire. Oh, what a, what, 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 what a hallowed philosopher he is. He made the statement near the end of his life, I wish I'd never been born. You know, brethren, um, that's where godless, godless world philosophy takes you. That's, where, that's, that, that's the direction it goes in. And the sad thing about it, listen, our society has bought into it. That's, that's, that's where uh, we are, you might say, as a people. And that inc include all the religions, the, the man-made religions of this world. Uh, it's it, it, empty deceit. You know, I, I'll tell you, a nature of, of virtually every man-made religion, man-made religion on this earth, and it's, they're going to show you how to reach God. They're going to show you what you need to do to be able to reach God. Do you realize that's mission impossible? Just, you know, it, it is so clear. We have fallen so far short, and he is so righteous and holy. You know, it's like trying to jump over the Grand Canyon. Good luck. You know, get an Olympic athlete out there. Oh, look how far he got. Woohoo! You know? Going to end up in the same place. No, brethren, there's nothing there. 
It's like, a, like those boys looking up in the sky at nothing. There, there's, there's nothing there. The truth is Christ. Christ came to you and reached out to you in that lost state that you were in and rescued you, you know? But so he says, brethren, every philosophy of the world is just empty and it's, it's deception and there's nothing there. Beware of the, of the philosophies of the world lest they kidnap you. Jesus said it this way in John 8, 31 and 32. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you will know, here it is, the truth. And the truth will make you free. What a difference. What a wonderful thing. There are three things that, that are characteristic of worldly philosophies. Three things. And he lists them right here. He says, he says um, according to... The, the traditions of men. Men's sacred traditions. You know, I can't help but think of evolution when I see that. You know, how, how he just absolutely bought into that theory of evolution. Do you realize that uh, there has been more things coming, coming up more and more that are literally disproving the theory of evolution? D disproving it. But it is still the sacred cow of the secular scientific community. And it's being taught religiously to our children and our young people. And they're being told this is a fact now. This is a fact when it's being disproved more than ever. You know, I think about way back in the 50s. A fellow named Emmanuel uh, Velikovsky. He wrote a couple of uh, books uh, that were... Um, shaking the uh, scientific community. One was Earth in Upheaval. And his theory was instead of the things that have come about in our world happening over millions of years very gradually, there have been some major upheavals in this world relatively recently that has made the world the way it is today. What's interesting about that is as we've done more and more space explanation, a lot of his theories are bearing out. But here's one of them he talked about. He says, take the ice age, you know. We're told that the last ice age, what was millions of years ago. He said, I'm here to tell you the last ice age was less than 10,000 years ago. And this is, this is one little way he, he made his point. Take Niagara Falls. In the last hundred years, we've seen, you know, Niagara Falls is gradually, you know, um, you know the, 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 the crest of it is breaking away under the force of the waterfalls very gradually. And they, by, by that time, you know, they had studied it for a hundred years. And in that hundred years, the, the crest had receded a hundred feet. So he says, we're talking about about a foot a year on the average that it's been receding. Well, he goes back. You can see where the crest originally was, you know, at the beginning. And it was 10,000 feet down the road. And that's where it started. And he said when the Ice Age really began to melt, of course, greater volumes of water fell over that wall, falls. And so it would, it would erode more rapidly than it sort of has leveled out to in our day. So he said the last Ice Age was less than 10,000 years ago. And you know what? That fits Bible chronology. That fits right with what the Bible says. I mean, I could go on and on and on about things like this that, that are just pointing out the, the air of the evolutionary theory. But I like the way I heard one person put it. He was a businessman. He had a little company that made meat cutters. And he said, uh, that there are 17 parts to my meat cutter. And I don't know about all that they're saying about evolution and everything, but I can tell you this. You could put those 17 pieces of a meat cover, cutter into a sack, and you could shake that puppy until kingdom come. You'll never get a meat cutter out of there. And just think how elementary that is to the, the intricacy of life. 
you know? So, <laughs> when Velikovsky came out with his book, he was castigated and vilified by the scientific community. Utterly castigated. <sighs> traditions of men. Beware of the traditions of men. You know, I think, uh, I, I, I read recently of a, of a debate when it came into the realm of, of you know, the Bible and, and Christianity. A debate between a conservative Christian that believed the Bible was God's word and a liberal pastor who was convinced that the Bible is not truly the word of God. And, uh, and so they had a debate. And I, I, w I want you to hear the stand that this pastor uh, was, uh, Edelin was his name, uh, the stand he took, I want to quote a little something he said in the debate, and he was quoting from, and he actually referencing a book entitled Jesus in, in History and Jesus in Mythology. And, and listen to what he said. Here's, here's part of his argument, really kind of the basis of his argument. This is a compilation of an international symposium. Scholars from all over the world all met and presented papers. In these papers, there's a definite separation between a historical person named Jesus and the Christ mythology that has built up around that person that is a continuation, a mythical diffusion. What I'm saying right now is not just Bill Edelin giving um, his opinion because when I taught at the University of Puget Sound, every one of my colleagues in the Department of Religion would not only fully agree with what I am saying right now, but this is what they taught. And I also think that it's safe to say that what I'm saying would be accepted in any major university and departments of religion in this country. They do look upon Christianity as being saturated with Zoroastrianism, an early Persian mythology, and Christianity as being saturated with Egyptian mythology and with Babylonian mythology. You see? You get, you get his point of view? All the experts agree. And we're the experts on the subject. You know what, you know what the Lord calls that? The traditions of men. He said, beware. It is, it is one of the characteristics of Philosophy and empty deceit. The traditions of men. The second thing is, uh, he goes on and says, according to the basic principles of the world. The basic principles there, litter is things in a row. And the idea is sort of the ABCs of human thinking, you know, natural human thinking, the ABCs of them. And you think about that, and of course, I think there's a mentality that, you know, it, it, fame and, and riches, and I'm going to be okay. You know, that, 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 that's what life's really about. He who dies with the most toys is the guy that's going to win here, you know. And so, uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, when somebody asked David Rockefeller, how much money do you need to be happy? His answer was priceless. A little bit more than you have. A little bit more than you have. Wow. Wow. Multimillionaire said that. Back in the day when multimillions was a lot of money. You know, um, Solomon, the little book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible really speaks to that. You know, that, the basic principles of life. Solomon was the wealthiest man of his day. And God had given him an incredible wisdom probably beyond any man who's ever lived other than Jesus Christ himself. And Ecclesiastes is about Solomon's pursuit of meaning in his life. And, and he had the means and the position and power to try whatever he wanted to the max, and he did. He tried pleasure to its limit. He tried um, knowledge and education. He got to the point, he knew more about the areas of science in his day than the experts in those areas. 
He tried throwing himself into great projects. Great projects to leave humanity, you know? Make my life mean something. You can go to Israel. In fact, when we go to Israel, we will see ruins of some of those great Solomon projects that are 3,000 years old, you know? You know what Solomon said about that? I want to save you a lot of time and a lot of energy, folks. You know what he said about that? He actually gave his conclusion at the beginning of the message and then went about proving it. But he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, chapter one verse 2, here it is. Here's, here's his conclusion. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. That's Solomon. Vanity of vanities. All is, A-L-L, all is vanity. The word means nothing. There's nothing there. It's an absolute empty void out there. Believe it or not, it was Jim Carrey, of all people, that made this statement. I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. <clears throat> I think about the parable of the sower. Jesus said the sower going out and sowing the seed, which is the word, the word of God. And some of it fell on the, the weedy, thorny ground, which just choked it out. And when he explained the meaning of that, he said, you know what that weedy, thorny ground is? That's the cares, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches. Basic principles of the world. Beware. It's interesting how some translations or translators translate that, that uh, basic principles they translate it elemental spirits. And they see things in a row as a military formation with a hierarchy. And it falls back on uh, fallen angels, demonic spirits. And it's interesting that in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2, verse 1 and 2, we're told, And you, Christian, he made, he, Christ, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Now, here it is. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's Satan. The spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. And so... <laughs> He's telling us very clearly these basic principles of the world are inspired and directed by the powers of darkness. They're behind them. What's their goal? And it is so obvious to steer mankind, to steer you away from Jesus. Jesus Christ. So, you know what that means? Christian, you know what that means? Brethren who have loved ones that are being steered in that direction, you know what that means? That means like he says in Ephesians 6, 12, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, in the spiritual realm. Amen. So brethren, here it is. Look at it. Take it to heart. In the, especially in the world we live in. <sighs> Beware lest anyone should rob, cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world. Be watch out for that. And here's the third thing. You've got, you've got the, the tradition of men and you've got the basic principles of the world. Here's the third thing that's characteristic of worldly philosophies of all sorts. And not according to Christ. And brethren, that's the key. That's where they miss the boat completely. And... And here's why. 
Notice what he says. You see, our first point is beware of human, <clears throat> human wisdom. Watch out. It's off base. Period. Off base. So, so he goes on and says, verse 9. For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And verse 10. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You know what he's saying there? Forget all that other stuff. Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer here. He says, he says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There was a point in human history in which Jesus set aside his, his glory in the Godhead and emptied himself, the Bible says. Didn't think that was something to be grasped and held on to. Emptied himself, took the form of a bondservant and became in the likeness of men. He became one of us. He became wholly a man. God became a man. And he is wholly a man. And he is God. Think of that for a minute. Do you realize there's a man at the throne of heaven? Because he set aside that and became a man and forever will be a man. Oh God. God. But one of us that he might save us. Amazing. One person put it this way. He said, the essence of God, the undivided, undivided and in its whole fullness, dwells in Christ, in his exalted state, so that he is the essential and adequate image of God. It's exactly what he said back in chapter 1, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Firstborn over all creation. You know? <clears throat> so, I like the way one person put it. Listen to this. We can see the, the fullness of God in his work in the heavens and the creation around us. But in Christ, we see the face of God. Don't you love that? So, all the fullness of God is in him. It's all there. Why in the word world or how can we go anywhere else but to him? So you see, with that, he says there in verse 10, and you, you, Christian, are complete in him. You're complete in him. You're complete. The English Standard Version says, you have been filled in him. A translator wrote it this way, and you have been given the fullness of Christ. Christian, you've got it. I remember going to the beach, the ocean, with my kids. And they love to play in the ocean, you know, with their tools and their cups and their, and their pails and and shovels and things like that, you know, and running out there in the surf. And I, one of them running back with a, with, with a plastic cup. And he ran up to me and said, Daddy, the Pacific Ocean is in my cup. <laughs> I said, well, looking out there at the vast, vastness of the Pacific Ocean, I said, well, you know, it's true, that's all the Pacific Ocean in there. That's all Pacific Ocean in there, you know. And that's kind of, kind of the spirit. You know, when Paul prays for us, uh, in the end of the third chapter in Ephesians, he says the most beautiful prayer for us. And, and one of his requests there, right near the end, is that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's, that's Christ in you, you know. And of course, this, this takes us right back to, to that elementary commandment regarding the Holy Spirit in the Word. And that is, be filled with the Spirit. There it is. You know? Hey, what? How? Surrender. Surrender your life. 
surrender everything in it over to the control of the Holy Spirit of God. You know? And I'm here to tell you that simply happens by faith. Because the offer's on the table from the living God to you. And there it is. And so it's, it's to be received. And so he says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Hmm. <clears throat> you know that capacity, that capacity grows in your walk with, it expands. That's part of your spiritual growth. It kind of expands. You know when I Premarital counsel couples, I have, I, I, you know, I'll tell them, when I married my wife Joyce and saw her coming down the aisle, my cup was filled with love for her. It couldn't be any more full than it was. It was as full as it could be in just love for that woman coming down the aisle. Now, 48 years later, there's no comparison. You know how I like to put it? It's now a 50-gallon drum filled with love for Joyce. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Here's the prayer around that request. Listen to this. I'm just going to take... A, 16 to 19 in Ephesians 3, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints, the believers, what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. Oh, that you might be overwhelmed with the vastness and the, the incredibleness, the beyond imagination of this love. Because it, it's beyond human understanding. It's so awesome. And that you might be filled up with all the fullness of God. You know? So, hmm. brethren, what are you facing? What are you facing? What are your needs? The answer is Jesus. And that is not a cliche. That's not a simplistic answer to a very, very complex problem. It is the truth. And it is the answer. You know, I can't tell you how I've seen over and over again. Somebody with an absolutely, a life absolutely in shambles. And then that brought them to to giving their, their life to Jesus. It brought them to just <laughs> receiving Jesus. And then I've seen him so change them and, and, and filled their lives with, with, with a new life that, that they would tell me, Pastor Brian, it was worth it. Whatever it was, it was worth it. For what I've got from him now. You know. <clears throat> I uh, heard the story some time back. Of a pastor. Who um, went the liberal bent. And began to. Uh, you know. Study textual criticism. And, and, and embrace that. You know. There's, there, there's errors in the Bible. And, and, and a lot of this is probably mythology. And things like that. And he was becoming very intellectualized. Regarding the Bible as a, as a pastor. And then his beloved wife. Died. And his world caved in. And fell apart. And, 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 and he was crying out. And you know what? All that liberal theology did him no good at all. Did not help a bit. But you know what did? 
Going back in his mind to when he was a child. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And he began to go back to the only place he knew. And that was to, to embrace that childlike faith in Jesus. That he had learned in Sunday school so long ago. That he had believed early on in his life and ministry. And there he found solace. And he found comfort. And he found strength for the day. And he became a renewed preacher of the gospel. Amen. I'm here to tell you. I am here to tell you. <clears throat> a great theologian. I forget his name. But he was a great theologian. Was asked one time. What's the greatest thing in your study of theology that you've learned? What's the greatest thing at all? And he said without hesitation, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's it. Remember that? Remember singing that in Sunday school? <clears throat> Join me, okay? Join me. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I'm one of those little ones. I are one of them. So, notice what he said there. Here's the word of God to you. You are complete in him. Who is the head of all principality and power. There is no power no force, no will that Jesus Christ doesn't have ultimately, ultimate authority over. And he loves you. He loves you. And he's with you. And Christian, he is in you. So... Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Brethren, brethren, we are barraged daily with the, the false wisdom of this world. Beware. And so I might say even this morning right here, what is it for you? Really? Really? Really, what is it? What's it going to be? Is it going to be human wisdom? Or is it going to be Christ? Christ. Amen. I like what Joshua said to the children of Israel. They had conquered the land. They were settled in the land. Joshua had led them there. And it's near the end of his life. And he gathers them together. And he says these words to them in Joshua 24, 15. He says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord... It doesn't seem a practical thing to do. It seems like there's so much more out there that really is, is more the answer than this. You choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of which, uh, which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. The gods on the other side of the river, you know, those on the other side. There's so many people in our country today that are going to the other side of the ocean to get enlightenment. Yoga is big. Meditation, you know. Uh, uh, how many have gone to India to be enlightened? Remember the, the Beatles in their heyday made a trip to India so they could get enlightened? All you have to do is look around in India and go, there's something wrong here. This place is dirty, it's rat infested, and the people are oppressed. What is the matter with you? That's stupid. You know? You're going to go, in the, you know, uh, those on the other side of the river over there, and you're going you're gonna to worship that? 
And he says, uh, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. Oh, yeah, yeah, in the land where our land. Secular humanism is the, is, is the word. Man is ultimate. He's the ultimate. Ma- material wealth is a big part of it. Or science is their God, you know? Science, the answer is in science. That has been so, over the years, proven misleading. What did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Brothers and sisters, (laughs) be that house. Be that house. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your living word. Thank you that you don't pull any punches, Lord. You just lay it out there as clear as a bell for us, your children. And now, Lord, I just pray for us all because we can be so easily fooled by the world. Lord, that we would cling to your truth, your word, and know that this is, this is the truth. This is the real truth. And this is life in a crazy mixed up world. Oh Lord, Lord, we look to you, we call upon you, we lean upon you. Lord, fill us afresh with the Holy Spirit even this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all of God's children said, Amen, Amen. Amen.